go from Daniel to King Jesus. to 1 Kings tonight, chapter 6, 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, I'll catch you back up, if you remember David has died and now Solomon is on the throne, David's son Solomon, and he is ready to build the temple, the first temple, remember they've just been meeting in the tabernacle, the, or the tent of meeting, as Moses started and they built that tent, and they carried it all the way across that wilderness for 40 years, right, and then they set up a tabernacle, and they've been meeting in that, David was not allowed to build the temple. Who can tell me why David was not allowed to build the temple? Go ahead, Wayne. Too much man of blood, man of war. That's what God had said. He will not have a man of bloodshed, a man of war to build my house. Last time we uh, discussed in chapter 5 that in, David has already prepared all of the materials that Solomon's going to need. He couldn't build it, but he could prepare it. And I mean, he set him up. You can get in Chronicles and read that and and here you can uh, read all of the things that David had provided, the gold, the, uh, everything. But he goes to Hiram, the king of Tyre, over in the north, an area by the sea. And he goes to him because he needs some materials for building. And he wants, these, he wants these precious stones, and he wants the cedar wood, and he wants the best of the best to build God's temple. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? If God said, Anna, I want you to build me a temple. Would you go get cheap plywood? You'd get mahogany, wouldn't you? See, I'd get mahogany, the best of the best, right? This is God's place. All right, so that's what's happening. Put yourself, and I said that because I wanted you to, not to embarrass Hannah, but to put you in, yourself in Solomon's shoes. So God's allowing you to build his first temple. Would you not take great pride in that? Would you not be very concerned? And see, so y'all pay attention. There's a lot of verses, so I'm going to move through them quickly. Uh and then we'll discuss anything you have at the end. Now, verse 1 says, Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, let me stop right here after the first verse. Y'all know that we're trying to do a lot, cover all these books of the Bible verse by verse, and you got all these different views out there, religious views, denomination views. Guess where when you can bring the church back into unity and settle a lot of arguments? Because you're going to hear this a lot. Well, everybody interprets the Bible differently, Derek. That's because everybody's wrong. But when you get into the Word, when you really break it down and go back, then you eliminate these arguments. So it's not opinions of men. For instance, right here is a big one. This date, when he says there, 418 in the 80th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. That's a date that's giving a marking point for the Exodus. When people want to debate with you over when the Exodus happens, 
right there is a marking point. Because we know that the reign of Solomon began in 971 B.C. and ended at 913 B.C. The temple was begun then in 967 B.C. Because it said there it's the fourth year of Solomon's reign. This means that the Exodus took place in 1447. Now, if anybody ever says, well, I don't think that's when the Exodus happened. I was watching Discovery Channel, and they told me, blah, blah, blah. Well, I know what the Word of God says. The Word of God says 480 years after the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, escaped out of Egypt. See there, I wanted to bring that out to you. Your Bible gives you the information that you need. Trust me, it does. It's just a matter of, now, how many of you, how many people are going around studying 1 Kings? Not many, right? So, we just happened to go through that on Sunday night at church. And, and I know for a fact that the Exodus was in 1447. Really? Where'd you get that at? First Kings? Hey, you ought to come down with me and join. We're going through First Kings on Sunday night. Just a little help there. But anyway, another thing here we see is that God's going to give uh, uh, Solomon detailed instructions. God had already given David detailed instructions of how to build his house. Look on the screen. First Chronicles 28. And I thought this was neat, and so I wanted you all to look at it too. First Chronicles 28. Verse 11, then David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch of the temple, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat. What's that room called? Where'd they put the Ark of the Covenant? Holy of Holies, good job, Dick. And the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord and for all the surrounding rooms, for the storehouses of the house of God and for the storehouses of the of the dedicated things. Now, the rest of tonight is pretty much about all of those rooms. So I'm not going to bog down on every little, you know, 20-something verses on every little room. But that's what God has told David. He said, this is my plan. This is what you're going to do. In verse Chronicles 28, 19, look at this one. At the end of that passage, all this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. So who designed the temple? The Lord did. Solomon didn't design it. David didn't design it. God Almighty himself designed this temple. Now I got to thinking about that, and I'll say something at the end. Wouldn't that be cool? God's giving you house plans. Have you ever thought about it that way? God says, here you go, David, here's the house plans I want you to Here's Solomon. We don't want Solomon to build it. Miss Sharon, you just built your house. Remember how much work was involved picking out every little thing? Can you imagine if God said, here it is. You don't have to worry about none of that. Just, just build it. <clears throat> All right, look at verse 2. As for the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, and its width 20 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. The porch in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits in length, corresponding to the width of the house, and its depth along the front of the house was 10 cubits. I don't know why with, with these modern translations they can't go ahead and change cubits to feet, but I did it for you. The temple was 90 feet long. How many of his house is 90 feet long? Most of our houses, a lot of our houses are close to 90 foot long. 90 foot long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You know, except for the height, it could fit in this room, the temple. 90 foot by 30 foot. The porches, when you add on the porches that's designed in this thing, it may stretch out to 110 feet long and 75 foot wide. You could still fit it in this room. So we're looking at 2,700 square feet of the structure of the building. This building is over 12,000 square feet. Right? You could put five of them in this building. So, wait a minute. This is God's place. You know, the God says things like, the earth is his footstool. <laughs> How do you take somebody that big and put them in this little 20, you know, so obviously this is not designed to house God. Remember what God said clearly? That he will not live in a temple made with hands. Understand what the purpose of the temple was. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> also for the house he made windows with artistic frames. That means they're, they're windows that are designed to be opened and closed, like they're shutters like. That's the way these windows work. Verse 5 says, Against the wall of the house he built stories encompassing the walls of the house around both the nave and the inner sanctuary. Thus he made side chambers all around. 
The lowest story was five cubits wide, and the middle was six cubits wide, and the third was seven cubits wide. For on the outside he made offsets in the wall of the house all around in order that the beams would not be inserted in the walls of the house. Detailed, right? If you've ever been in construction work, you kind of picked up on some stuff here. This is not taking the easy way out. I mean, this is really notching things out and fitting things. Uh, this is some very high-end detailed architecture work going on is what he's saying here. The house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry, and there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. Think about that. No noise in the temple. Now, <clears throat> they, kept the, they kept the noise away from the temple. They kept the materials away from the temple. They were prepared outside the temple. Someone has said, I read this in some commentaries, and I thought it was very good. Look at what's happening here. Everything is being done on the outside, preparing stones, cutting them to bring them in. Does that sound like us outside the kingdom of God, being prepared on the outside to enter in? Do you see some, some uh, similarities there? I thought that was pretty neat. Look at verse 8. The doorway up for the lowest side chamber was on the right side of the house, and they would go up winding stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the house and finished it, and he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. He also built the stories against the whole house, each five cubits high, and they were fastened to the house with timbers of cedar. So obviously, again, we see here that this is the best of materials that he's gotten from Tyre. It's the best architecture. All of this was God's design, uh, which makes it even neater to me. And... One thing that we see here in similarities, what did Jesus say about the church? He said, I will build my church. What do we know about who comes into the church? It's his will, right? John 1, 13, we're not saved by the will of man, by the blood, but by what? By the will of God. We're saved by his plan, his choice, his will. All of this, everything about the temple is God's design. It's God's plan. It's God's timing. And it's even God's man. Everything about it, God is in complete control of. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, Concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word with you, which I spoke to David your father, which was, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Can you imagine how Solomon must have felt after receiving this word from the Lord? I would think that instantly he knew, you know what, the Lord is accepting of me. The Lord is going to use me. Solomon also would have known that the Lord has given him a great responsibility and that his behavior was very important to God. I think that's something that hit me when I was reading this. My Christianity the gift of salvation that he's given me should be very important to me. And my behavior should, should be very important to me because what? It really matters to God. That's what he told Solomon. Look at verse 14. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Then he built the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house to the ceiling, he overlaid the walls on the inside with wood, and he overlaid the floor of the house with boards of cypress. He built 20 cubits on the rear part of the house with boards of cedar from the floor to the ceiling. He built them for it on the inside as an inner sanctuary, even as the most holy place. The house, that is, the nave in front of the inner sanctuary was 40 cubits long. There was cedar on the house within, carved in the shape of gourds and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone seen. This place was beautiful, I'm sure. Now, verse 16 back there was describing what we'll get to in just a second. It's the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is the special, the furthest most uh, place in the back where only the high priest would enter one time a year. And if you, you might have heard me tell the story that they would always tie a rope to the high priest when he went in there in case he did something wrong. If he did something wrong in there, if he didn't light something right or set something right, you know, he was given detailed instructions. And if he failed in any little point of his job, God struck him dead. 
and they would put bells on him so when you know as long as the the bells were moving they knew he was alive when there wasn't no bells then they would drag him out nobody would go in there nobody went behind that curtain all right nobody what did jesus do to that curtain later right he splits it so now what do we all have access to it's not just the high priest anymore we all have access to the throne of god right Yes, yeah. Um, I don't know where right now. I have to look, but and it's not. I, I you don't see that uh, biblically, but that's more of a Jewish. They all knew about it. It's been passed down. I don't know of any passage that tells exactly of a priest that that happened to. But that's kind of uh, when you look in the Talmud and understand, you know, Jewish history, they'll tell you about that. So, uh, <clears throat> 19 says then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place there the ark of the covenant of the lord the inner sanctuary is 20 cubits in length 20 cubits in width and 20 cubits in height and he overlaid it with pure gold he also overlaid the altar with cedar this is where he's going to place the ark of the covenant in what we're calling the holy of holies what he calls here the inner sanctuary um it's going to be a 30 feet cubed 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. The perfect little 30 foot cube square. And that's the inner sanctuary, what will be called the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> now, the temple was not for the people of Israel. The temple was built for the priests to meet with God on behalf of the people. Do you remember that started back in Exodus and in Deuteronomy? Read about that. Only the, only the Levites, the ones who were the, uh, the temple priests, could go in there. Uh, into the tent of meeting and only the high priest would meet in the holy of holies and they would meet with god on behalf of the people the people would gather in this temple here and worship in what we would call the outer courtyard they had the outer courtyard outside of the holy of holies they would have the uh, the courtyard of the priest the court of the priest they would have the court of the women and then they would have the court of the gentiles so imagine these series of rooms that's been built, okay? So if you first walked up, there'd be a court. Even in the, the, the second temple, when you walked up into the temple grounds, it would be Gentiles out there, okay? People mingling around, doing business and stuff. That's where Jesus had turned over the money tables, right? Then you would go into the court of the women. Only Jewish women were allowed there. And then you would go into the court of, of, the, of the priest, and only the priest, and then the Holy of Holies, right? That's the sex, that's the... Uh, series that was laid out verse 21 uh let's move on down through the rest of these uh this is where he's really going to be in describing the more finer the finishing job you know the main part has been framed up it's been structured now we get into the finished part and this is where i would love to be able to go back in time you know i've always thought when we get to heaven maybe god will because there's no time maybe he lets us hey would you like to see the building of the temple you know, I mean, you've been up here for 2,000 years. Yeah, let's go see the building of the temple. Because I'm going to need at least 1,000 with Jesus, right? You know, but anyway, I want to go see that. I want to see this cedar and this gold laid over it. And uh, anyway, so Solomon overlaid, look at verse 21. Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold. And he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary. And he overlaid it with gold. He overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid it with gold. Also in the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Remember this, I'm going to talk about it in a second. Cherubim. And this is at the inner sanctuary, which is the Holy of Holies. Five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub. From the end of one wing to the end of the other wing were ten cubits. The other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherub, cherubim were of the same measure and the same form. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was the other cherub. He placed the cherubim in the midst of the inner house, and the wings of the cherubim were spread out, so that the wing of the one was touching the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall. So their wings were touching each other in the center of the house. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. Then he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. 
inner and outer sanctuaries. Can you just see it getting more and more detailed here? Just the, just the beauty of it all. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. You know, that was hard to get. But even doors of olive wood. The lintel and five-sided doorpost. In verse 32, he says, So he made two doors of olive wood, and he carved on them carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold. And he spread the gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So also he made for the entrance of the nave four-sided doorposts of olive wood, and two doors of cypress wood. The two leaves of the one door turned on pivots, and the two leaves of the other door turned on pivots. He carved on it cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and he overlaid them with gold evenly applied on the engraved work. There's a lot of detail and a lot of discussion of what? What do we keep seeing through this whole thing? Cherubim. Where do you remember God placing the cherubim before? Where? What did you say? Where in the, huh? What's your answer? There you go. Genesis 3.24, look on the screen. So Adam and Eve have sinned, and God, you're out of the garden. And what did he do when they put them out of the garden? Look at this verse. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim. And the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. God's got a special use for cherubim. What does it appear to be to you? To stand guard over. To block. Right? What are we still seeing here? The purpose, when, and I was telling uh, young Brooklyn last night, you know, young girl said, why can't we see God? I thought, what a great question. You know, for her age, that was great. So I had to take her back and explain to her that when man sinned, we lost the right to be in the presence of God. They were kicked out of the garden. And that was that, that's that eternal separation. And because we're of the seed of Adam, we're born from Adam and Eve, none of us have the right to be in the presence of God. We're outside of the garden. And there's been cherub and the flaming swords blocking it. Nothing can come into his presence. Even here in the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies and putting up the curtain, you could not go beyond it. You could not be in the presence of God. Why can't we be in the presence of God? Because we're sinners. The only reason, the only one he allowed to come into his presence was the whole was the high priest once a year, and he had to go through the most unbelievable ceremonial washings to make himself pure enough to go in there. He had to do all the sacrificing for him to you know he had to be the sacrifices for his sins, and then he went in there and made the sacrifice for the people. Right. So there's the constant reminder all the way up to the cross that we could not be in the presence of Christ. But as soon as Jesus died on that cross, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Now we have access back to who? To a holy God. Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in wrapping up in the last three verses, he built the inner court with, the th with three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. That's when he started it. And then it says here, in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished throughout all its parts and according to all its plans. I like that. He finished it. He didn't do like part of it and leave it hanging there for a little while. He finished it. That's a lesson to all of us men, right? We should finish our projects. <laughs> and according to so he was seven years in building yeah, okay, that's what the Bible says. He was seven years in building it. So if you want to say, well, technically he was seven years and six months, then you go ahead and say that if you want to. But the Bible says he was seven years in building it. So this temple, do you know where it was built at? Let me give you a little modern day. Let me bring you forward where this temple's built at. It was built on Mount Moriah. Now you may think, well, Mount Moriah didn't mean anything to me. But do you do remember the story of Abraham where he was going to sacrifice his son Isaac? That's where he did it, on Mount Moriah. Okay? Now, a thousand years later, Solomon is building the temple in the same spot on this Mount Moriah where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, we know, if we're studying Daniel with me, that this temple is going to stand uh, until 586 B.C. And who destroys it? Babylon, right? They destroy the temple. And then it's rebuilt 70 years later. 
Who, who goes apart? Who, who goes back to rebel? Zerubbabel, you'll remember that name, Nehemiah's story, you know, and Nazareth, you can read about it. They go back 70 years, and they rebuild the temple. Fast forward all the way to the time of Herod, the same Herod that was around when Jesus was there, and he, he uh, adds to the temple, okay? And then, what happened in 70 A.D.? The second temple was kaput. Jesus had said not one stone be left on another. And the only thing they have is a small little retaining wall out there called the, the Wailing Wall where the Jewish people are allowed to go to the Wailing Wall. Yeah, it's not too small. But, uh, but in this same area where the temple set, we call it the Temple Mount, guess what's sitting there today? The Dome of the Rock. It was built in 692. I looked that up. 692 A.D., the Dome of the Rock was built here. This was supposedly the site where Muhammad ascended to heaven right, and got his vision. You know, after his miraculous trip from, from Mecca to Palestine or to Jerusalem overnight. And then he ascended to heaven and got this vision. He comes back down. and Anyway, it's all junk. All satanic. Now, what's coming next there on this site? Daniel 9 tells us there's going to be a third temple built there. The Antichrist, peace and peace, and he's going to let the Jews rebuild their temple. I want you to know something. They're sitting there today with the materials ready to go. They've been ready to go. They're waiting to build that temple. The problem is, if they start building that temple now, what's going to happen across the strip from them? You know, they're going, rockets are going to start coming over and blow it up. So they're stuck waiting on this Antichrist to come in and give them the freedom to rebuild this temple. So it's kind of a fast forward from Solomon's Day all the way up to today. And, you know, isn't that neat? Anybody have comments, questions, or anything about the... The lesson? Go ahead, Chad.